You have to understand up front that there is a very definite reason neither the we that used to be us, nor the we that is me, nor the me that is me, have ever really tackled the topic of magic in this podcast, which is ostensibly a vocabulary builder for GMs to use in spicing up their role-playing games. It would seem like the obvious thing to do. After all, magic in one form or another is a part of almost every RPG out there, from the complicated varieties of magic in Dungeons and Dragons, to the techno-magic of Shadowrun, to the force powers in your choice of Star Wars RPGs, magic is nearly everywhere in tabletop gaming. You'd think it would have been one of the first things we talked about way back when. So why didn't we? What kept us from discussing it? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward, while also being rather complicated, which is often the way of things around here. The reason is this. What actually is magic? And according to whom? And which magic are we talking about? And about 30 or 40 more questions that must be answered before we can even really get down to the main point of the discussion. In the old days, when we were first starting, just getting to the point at which we could all agree on what we are talking about would have eaten up several hours-long episodes. Neither of us felt like doing that. But inevitably, someone had to ask. Sure, it took six or seven years, but eventually someone asked why we hadn't covered the remaining standard classes from D&D, which are, naturally, all covered under the heading of Magic User. I'm sure they meant no harm. So definitely, on no account should you go looking for a certain Mr. Benny's Nachos on Twitter and beat him about the head, neck, and chest until he forgets he ever knew us. Just talking about magic users seems like a simple enough task. They are the group of people who use magic to accomplish certain things that would otherwise not be possible in a world that operated wholly on natural laws. But... If that's your initial take on the subject, you clearly have never heard of this show's episodes on bards, paladins, rangers, and barbarians. And all the other classes as well. Because if we have learned nothing else at all over the course of this show, we have learned that nothing is as simple as it seems. Nothing. Not even the name of the game that kicked off this whole mess in the first place. See our episodes on dungeons and on dragons. For further proof. Unfortunately, before anything can be explained about the mainly magic using character classes of D&D and similar role playing games, there are several major roadblocks that have to be dealt with first, and that is going to necessitate a rather lengthy episode. A rather very lengthy episode, if I'm honest. Well, to be perfectly truthful, a rather lengthy series. Of episodes. So get yourself some comforting beverages of your choice and prepare to snuggle in as we begin with the first and largest roadblock in front of us. Just what is magic anyway, and what do we mean by it? This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. No, seriously, what magic do you mean? Because there are at least three distinct kinds, and which one you mean can have a lot to do with what sort of characters you think need to exist in your game. And while the three kinds do have some overlap, it isn't sufficient overlap so that one type of character can comfortably handle all three. The words magic user are a fine umbrella to hide under when it rains, but the umbrella is so big that practically anyone who can waggle their fingers and wands can cluster under it and get nary a drop of the rain of inquiry upon them. Magic user as a catch-all description doesn't make things easier to discuss. It makes things more complicated. Part of the problem is that by the time you get enough experience playing games like Dungeons & Dragons to arrive at a point where you need this sort of podcast to help you grow and expand your vocabulary and make your games better, you already think you know what magic is and how to define it. And by and large, that's the fault of one particular author. An author 
who did not frequently stray into the realms of fantasy. Arthur Charles Clark was born in Minehead, Somerset, England in 1917. After a youth spent on a farm gazing at stars, collecting fossils, and reading American pulp sci-fi stories, he began contributing to the Journal of the Junior Astronomical Association and soon convinced them to include an astronautics section, which he then began to write for regularly. A few years later, he had turned that little sideline into a full-fledged writing career. Now, you'll know Clark, I'm certain, to be one of the very highly esteemed writers of science fiction stories to come out of the 40s. He, along with Heinlein and Asimov, were the three giants of science fiction, and their work from that time right on through to the turn of the century, the turn of the most recent century, that is, still influences sci-fi works to this day. Clark's final story was published in 2008. But Clark also wrote non-fiction books on science topics and contributed numerous papers to a variety of serious scientific journals on a range of subjects that piqued his interests over the years. He knew his stuff and was something of a visionary, even going so far as to claim credit for inventing the geosynchronous communications satellite, or at least the idea of the geosynchronous communications satellite. The actual work of coming up with one that worked and deciding how it worked was left to people who were more sort of doers than imaginers. As we've discussed elsewhere, though, no one who deserves the credit for actually coming up with stuff gets it, just the folks who managed to popularize it. So what do satellites and sci-fi novels have to do with magic? Practically nothing. But we must cleave to our traditions around here and occasionally digress. Even as, in digressing, we approach our intended target. See, one of the many non-fiction books Clark wrote was titled Profiles of the Future, an Inquiry into the Limits of the Possible. And in it, in part, Clark attempted to explain and warn the general public and the scientific community that science wasn't about finding the limits of what you could do, but rather constantly expanding those limits in new and exciting ways. The problem, as he saw it, was that science was becoming set in its ways and beholding to a tradition rather than really going out there and discovering the new. So in the book, Clark attempted to give a view of the future as focused on technology in this case that wasn't so much of the we will all have flying cars type, but rather the possible extent of what we could accomplish with technology and how to go about getting there. And it was here he first proposed what became known as Clark's Three Laws. Or at least he did eventually, in subsequent editions. It actually took until the 1974 edition of the original 1952 book before he got all three of his laws in. But what are Clark's three laws and why do they interest us? Well, the first two are easy and have little to do with what we are aiming at, so let's get those out of the way quickly. Law number one. When a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. By which Clark meant that given a depth of knowledge in a particular field, the scientist in question tends to understand well those things that their field is currently capable of, but has a very poor understanding of what is potentially possible in the future as new knowledge the scientist does not yet have becomes available. The impossible becomes possible the more you learn. Law number two. The only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Pushing the envelope, in other words, is how we get to new places and learn new things. If we only study things we already know, how do we make progress? The unknown is more likely to be innovative and progress our knowledge. And that is where science and technology should operate. And finally, we come to law number three, the one we are most interested in, and the law that has been causing so much trouble for the gamer's general understanding of magic and what it is. Law number three states, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. See, when you ask a certain type of gamer what magic is in a given setting, wanting to know how it works, one of the first things you will hear is this law quoted back to you. 
Magic isn't really magic, they imply. It's just technology applied in ways we don't understand. Technology has advanced to such a point that its inner workings are so incomprehensible that we mere mortals have taken to calling it magic, and that's all there is to it. Which is about as unhelpful an explanation as you can get, because it's not really any sort of explanation at all. And we need to clear up a few things before we can progress. In the wider world, any sufficiently advanced technology as indistinguishable from magic is taken to mean that to most people, they don't really care how a thing works as long as it continues to work. You might not know in specific detail exactly how your 55-inch flat panel TV and subscription streaming service works, and pretty much don't care as long as you can still get your daily baseball game. For you, Joe or Jane Average, it might as well be magic. Other people are responsible for knowing how it all works and keeping it going. When it stops working, you get upset, but not in any specific way because you don't know what is broken or what to do about it. There's a whole other type of person responsible for knowing those things, and you'll have to schedule an appointment and wait possibly forever for them to eventually show up at a time they promised they wouldn't show up at, having indicated an otherwise broad range of times they guaranteed they would show up at. This is the popular view of the law. But it's the wrong view. This isn't really what Clark meant at all, nor is it even the context in which Clark first proposed the law. See, in Profiles of the Future, the law isn't even fully treated in the essay in which it appears. It's just a footnote at the end of the essay explaining how a French magazine had referred to his first two statements as Clark's laws, and that he was going to add a third law to the list and leave it at that without much further direct explanation. What Clark actually meant in the essay that relates to the third law without directly explaining it was that to historical scientists, if you had told them, for example, that in the future mankind would be able to harness the atom and derive energy from it, they would have looked at you as if you were crazy and declared that it would have been magic to do so. They couldn't see from where they were standing what future knowledge and technology might bring. It was this outlook that was the problem in determining the possibilities of the future. This was the point Clark was making. At some point, someone is going to get to that impossible future point, and then it won't be magic anymore. It will just be technology. Throwing acid arrows is pure magic. At least until some guy named Melf comes along and shows you how to put a fairly basic and common acid in a fairly basic and easily breakable bladder, and then it's just technology and good aim with a slingshot. The other thing that is wrong with the third law was that when Clark originally proposed it, it was published for the first time in a letter to the editors of Science Magazine in January of 1968. He was responding to Isaac Asimov and codifying his view of UFOs. To quote, Clark's third law is even more appropriate to the UFO discussion. Any really competent extrapolation shows interstellar travel to be a rather simple engineering accomplishment, to be expected within a mere two or three centuries of the control of thermonuclear fusion. The real mystery is the apparent absence of genuine UFOs. Essentially, the only secret ingredients to things we now consider technologically impossible are time and the ability to imagine them. Flying cars are inevitable, it's just a matter of when. So, we've hung a lot on a quote that isn't properly understood by the people using it to answer a fairly basic question at your gaming table and given people the wrong impression all the way through. Magic is not poorly understood, incredibly advanced technology. So what, actually, is it? Well, before we begin digging into what constitutes magic, let's be clear about a couple of things. First... There are avenues to this discussion that we will not go down. I'm not about to pretend that magic is real and discuss how spells are cast or any of that sort of thing. I lived through the 80s, and I don't need the kind of headaches even a clear-headed, reasonable discussion of the vast, complicated history of the subject would bring decades later. Besides, if that's the sort of discussion you're looking for, you've probably already got access to far better information than I have that treats the subject in whatever manner you favor. And besides, besides, there's just too much of it. Oh, I know, you're looking at your watch and already starting to wonder how long this episode is really going to go, and if it is headed to that sort of length, why not dive in? But there's too much even for that. 
way too much. Instead, it's time for a broad overview and enough information to know what we're talking about and what that is going to mean for the games we play. What sort of thing is it that RPGs are trying to loosely emulate, laying the groundwork for later comparisons? First and foremost, no, I am not talking about what I'll call performance magic, which encompasses stage magic, close-up magic, and illusion. Not to be confused with the school of magic in D&D and other games called illusion, of course. More on that later. Performance magic is the sort of magic you see on TV these days, or go see someone do on stage. Think Penn and Teller and famous 70s magician Doug Henning. It's magic for entertainment purposes. Of course, many of the basic principles of performance magic were developed quite a long time ago. Much of it was even meant to emulate supposed real magic. Think of things like people passing through apparently solid walls, or torn up bits of dove turning into a whole piece of paper, or even a ball changing position right before your eyes without seeming to cross any of the intervening space. People were performing the cups and balls trick perhaps as long ago as 2500 BCE in Egypt, if we can trust the interpretation of a single tomb carving. It shows two men with four large upside-down bowls in front of them. It is the only carving of its kind ever found, and so the interpretation may be open to debate, but it seems more than likely that the cups and balls were in use for a significant period of time before firmer evidence from 3 BCE turned up. And as magic tricks go, the cup and balls is pretty well the epitome of basic magic. More than one legendary performer has declared cups and balls as the best test of real professional magicians because it involves all the basic skills a performing magician needs. The performance itself is relatively simple, and you've probably seen it a half dozen times at least. A magician presents three cups and lines them up upside down. Then he places three balls in front of the cups and begins to alternately cover, shuffle, and uncover the balls with the cups. Balls appear to pass through the cups in various ways, and eventually everything comes to rest, and the cups are lifted to show some variation from the original set of balls. Sometimes there are color or size changes, sometimes the balls have disappeared entirely, and sometimes they are replaced by something else altogether, like fruit or small animals. The trick can be set up with any sort of containers and stand-ins for the balls, and variations include the usual batch of con games like the shell game, or find the lady in which a queen card is shuffled around the table with two others and the mark is asked to select the queen from among them, usually after placing a significant wager. What makes cup and ball so essential and so basic to the magician's repertoire is the skills involved in pulling it off successfully. All the basics are there, misdirection, sleight of hand, and manual dexterity. Perfecting cups and balls means the magician in question has mastered these skills and can use them to great effect in other tricks. But what keeps performance magic from being considered as part of our definition of magic is that all performance magic operates within the rules of the natural world that you and I live in. Performance magicians are not bending the rules of nature in order to move a card from the middle of the deck to the top, or to pull a coin from behind your ear, or to replace all the balls under the cups with cute little chicks. It might appear that way to the uninitiated, but that's not what's really happening. All the normal, natural rules are in effect, and we trick ourselves into believing that something outside the bounds of nature is occurring in order to explain what is really just a cleverly concealed effect. For our purposes, the discussion of magic as it pertains to Dungeons & Dragons has to bend or break the rules of the natural world. It has to be supernatural. Magic, real magic as meant by most people, can be divided into two major groups or types, and explaining both types is going to significantly muddy the waters of our discussion as we try to get to grips with what magic is and how it is used in our favorite role-playing games because, as we have often said before around here, most of the time Gary and company were just making things up as they went along in order to facilitate their own games. They had a broad, well-read understanding of the things they included in the game, but they didn't worry much about the level of accuracy and correctness in use. For them, and consequently for D&D, magic fell into two very broad groups. The first and most problematic major grouping of magic is theurgy. And if you know your ancient Greek, you'll know that means miracle worker. And 
in order to not shoot straight off into the weeds and never come back, the explanation about to be given is going to be extremely simplified. Theurgy is the art or technique of compelling or persuading a god or beneficent or supernatural power to do or refrain from doing something. In other words, its divine magic is defined by D&D and subsequently other RPGs. See, in the earliest of early editions of D&D, 1974's box set of rules, the white pamphlets, specifically Volume 1, Men and Magic, you could be one of three types of characters. You could be either a fighting man, a magic user, or a cleric. That was it. Those were your three choices for character class. The fighting man was, as you might imagine, responsible for doing all the fighting. The magic user was, fittingly enough, responsible for all the magic. And if you were the sort of player who would hem and haw over the crucial decision regarding which to be to the point where you were delaying the game, then the cleric was the role for you as it was intended to be a halfway point between the other two. Why a cleric and not, for instance, a paladin? Well, let me direct you to our episodes on paladin and clerics, where I'm sure we eventually managed to answer that question. For now, though, take it as written that the cleric was half fighting man and half magic user. The reason for that design choice, beyond being indecisive, was twofold. On the one hand, you had the fighting man. Tough, durable, and not always male despite the class being called that. They were very good characters to play because more than anything else, they could survive the early levels just on the advantages provided by their weapons, armor, and skill in battle. Need to take down hordes of kobolds and goblins? Fighting man is the superior choice. The magic user, on the other hand, was not. For many, many levels, the magic user was the worst choice to do anything with other than stay back at the castle and read books. Except they too needed to advance in levels and that meant they needed to get experience, which pretty much could only be had by actually fighting things. So your typical magic user would throw their entire complement of both spells at whatever the critter du jour was, and then run away and hide, or possibly switch to crossbow and hope. This was the method of combat for many, many adventures. Fighting man does all the hard work, magic user tries to stay out of the way and alive. And then, about midway through the life of the magic user, if it was going to last more than a few levels, the world changed. Suddenly, they would become a bit more competent. They had more spells to use. They could use more of them at a time. And then, a couple of levels after that, the fighting man stopped being able to show up at the battle in time to have anything left to kill. Because the magic user would bamf in, waggle some fingers, say a few words, and the enemy would just sort of... die. All at once. Nothing left for the fighting man to do, but ride the magic user's coattails to the end of the campaign. Now, if you didn't happen to enjoy spending the first half of your level climb worried that an elf with allergies would sneeze on your magic using character and kill it outright while you waited to come into your own power, or the fact that your fighting man character was going to be useful for the first half and not at all for the second half of his or her life, then what you needed was a cleric who could be a fighting man to begin with and then slowly transition into a magic user as things went along. What they needed, though, was a way to differentiate themselves from just being what we would call a multi-class character today. A few early levels in fighter and a few later levels in some sort of wizardy type. The cleric accomplished that differentiation by being restricted to a particular set of weaponry as a fighter and a distinctly different sort of magic as a magical type. And so... Gary and company landed on divine magic as the province of the cleric. Theurgy. Why is theurgy or divine magic different from the other sort? Well, as discussed, the idea behind divine magic is that you are asking some other power, for lack of a better word, to take or not take a particular action on your behalf by working through you. You want a miracle, small as it might be, and you get it by what D&D used to call praying for it. You asked your god for a favor. Say you are a representative, like maybe a cleric, of Kord, to pick a D&D centric example. You encounter a man with a horrible, disfiguring disease begging in an alley. They beg for pity, and you ask Kord to bless this poor, misbegotten soul with his strength. 
You don't say, in my own name, I bless you and heal you, because Cord will take notice and get upset. Like many gods, he does not appreciate you encroaching on his territory, especially since you are making it sound like you are one of the invitees at the all-deity banquet. There are only so many seats at the table, after all. Instead, to avoid all that, you say, in the name of Cord. Or maybe you need to cross a great body of water with, say, several thousand of the sorts of people who continually get lost in the desert because they just can't follow the rules. Hotly pursued by, let's say, a tribe of very angry gnolls. Arriving at the shore of this body of water, you're told by Cord to hold out your staff. Doing so, Cord then parts the waters for you, and all the thousands of refugees cross safely. As soon as they do, Cord releases the waters, and the gnolls develop a newfound fear of water and never field an Olympic swimmer. These and other miracles all follow a similar pattern. It is through various prophets and religious leaders that miracles occur, what we'll call the duly authorized representative of a god, in whatever form that might take. And the important word is through, because it is by the will of the relevant god that these miracles are allowed to occur with their duly authorized representative as a sort of conduit, not the will of a mere mortal. Prayers and supplications let a god know that something is wanted. They bring the situation to a god's notice, which is a theologically complicated sentence, but leave it be for now. The results, when such prayers are granted, are meant to ensure a growth of belief and faith in that god, in addition to any other handy effects. This isn't just limited to clerics and paladins, though. To a greater or lesser extent, it also applies to the magic of druids and rangers. The difference being that they are calling on nature to perform their miracles rather than a strictly speaking god. These characters were asking for something to happen through another agency rather than making it happen themselves. Very similar, but slightly different. Which will no doubt cause us no problems at all when we come to discussing the remaining magic using character classes in more current editions. The important bit to remember is that all these kinds of characters that use theurgy fall into the divine category of magic use. The other kind of magic in the two large divisions of magic is one we will probably be more interested in for the duration of this series. Thaumaturgy. But since the word thaumaturgy didn't come along until the mid to late 1800s, and that means it was something else entirely prior to that, and since we've come a long way already just getting this far, let's save all of thaumaturgy and its long long history for the next episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. I know, I know, it's been a long time coming. If you are interested in the whys and wherefores and some sort of explanation, see the post titled The Status of the Thing at gmwordoftheweek.com. If you aren't interested, well, bless your little heart. I'm just happy one came out, too. This episode is a Fiddleback production and was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Find more episodes at gmwordoftheweek.com and follow at Fiddleback on whatever it is we're calling Twitter this week. Or maybe just Blue Sky. Who knows where I'll be by then. You can help support the show when and as it comes out at buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback with both one-time and ongoing pledges. There you will meet a legion of other fans who have stuck it out, been patient, and most of all been understanding. It's a good, solid group of people, and you are more than welcome to join them. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions, home of music to podcast by for production and pleasure. Visit them at sessions.blue. 90% of most magic merely consists of knowing one extra fact. <laughs>